They were queens and paratroopers and scholars and spies. Some held guns, others held office. Some were famous, others have been forgotten by history. Until now, these five Jewish women all changed the world in their own ways. These are their stories. Queen Esther. We're gonna take it back, way back, to a fateful beauty contest in the ancient Persian Empire. The king had just, shall we say, disposed of his wife. Bye, Ellie. Ah. And was in the market for a new one. So naturally, he hosted a beauty pageant, which I guess was how people found love before Tinder. The winner of the beauty pageant was a Jewish girl named Esther. But before she went into the palace to meet her new husband, her cousin slash uncle slash adoptive father slash no one really knows, gave her some important advice. Don't tell anyone you're Jewish. The king spent most of his time partying and drinking while his second in command, Haman, did his best to run the show. Haman was a totally normal guy with totally normal interests. Long walks on the beach, making people bow down to him, planning genocides, the usual. When the king's second in command asks you to bow before him, you usually do it, unless you're Esther's cousin slash uncle slash adoptive father who refused on the grounds that Jews don't bow to anyone but God. Well, Haman didn't like that. So he very reasonably asked the king for permission to kill every Jew in the empire. And because the king was, one, probably drunk, and two, completely unaware that his queen was Jewish, he was like, yeah, go for it. Haman started planning. He even had a day he picked out for when he'd start the genocide. Because you gotta be organized when you're wiping out your religious minorities, right? Understandably, the empire's Jews started freaking out. But they had a secret weapon. Her name was Esther. The king may have not have been very empathetic, but he really liked his queen. So when she told him that one of his closest advisors was planning to murder her and all of her friends and family, he was like, not on my watch. Haman just happened to be in the room at that time, sweating buckets. But all his begging and pleading couldn't change the king's mind. He was publicly hanged. And the date that he'd chosen to kill all the Jews became a day of celebration. One that we still celebrate. The Jewish holiday of Purim more or less exemplifies the old joke. They tried to kill us, they failed, let's eat. Purim involves feasting, drinking, wearing costumes, and generally celebrating the fact that we're still here. And it's all thanks to Queen Esther, who used her power to save her people. What an icon. Osnat Barzani. Queen Esther commanded an empire. The next woman on our list commanded an entire Jewish community. Okay, that might not sound remarkable to us in the 21st century, but Osnat Barzani didn't live in the 21st century. She was born in a medieval Kurdish community, which was, like most other communities at that time, led by men. Her father Shmuel had founded a number of yeshivot, Jewish schools that were only open to, wait for it, men. There was just one problem. Shmuel had no sons, and someone needed to carry on his legacy. So he did something revolutionary. He taught Osnat hoping she would become his successor. Osnat may have been a trailblazer, but she still lived in a traditional community. So she got married, but her arrangement was pretty unusual. She made her husband promise that he'd never make her do any domestic work so she could focus on her Torah studies. He agreed. Still, when Osnat's father died, her husband took over the yeshiva, but it was Osnat who led the students through the rabbinical training. Osnat outlived her husband, so eventually, she ended up officially running the yeshiva, but still she found time to study on her own and write poetry. And of course, to flex her supernatural powers. Okay, so the last one is more myth than fact, but according to legend, Osnat had a direct line to the mysterious powers of the universe. When a synagogue burst into flames, she alerted the angels who stopped the fire. She warded off intruders by calling out holy names. She was even able to limit the number of kids she had so she could spend time studying and leading. And in the days before birth control, that certainly seemed like magic. For centuries, Middle Eastern Jews made pilgrimages to Osnat's grave. And though the Jewish community was ethnically cleansed from Iraq, no one can erase Osnat's incredible legacy. Chana Senesh. Unfortunately, ethnic cleansing is kind of a theme in Jewish history. Springtime, 1944. We're deep in the forest, somewhere remote in Yugoslavia. Out of the blue, three female parachutists from mandatory Palestine fall from the sky. Among them is a woman named Hannah Senesh. Hannah was on a mission. She knew that one woman wouldn't be able to save all the Jews of Europe. 
She also knew she may not make it back alive, but that didn't matter because this was personal. Hannah had been born in Hungary. She escaped the constant anti-Semitism by moving to Mandate Palestine in 1939. Things weren't peaceful there either. So she joined the Haganah, the largest Jewish paramilitary in the region. The Jews of Palestine weren't just gonna let the Nazis ravage Europe. In cooperation with the British army, they decided to send parachutists into Europe to rescue whatever Jews they could. 250 applied, 32 were selected, including Hannah. When Hannah and her team arrived in Yugoslavia, they linked up with Jewish partisans, who were amazed to see a woman from Eretz Israel drop from the sky. But Hannah proved she could do anything a man could do. The partisans crossed from Yugoslavia into Hungary in the middle of the night. At some points, they had to swim with all of their supplies on their backs. To keep the rifles dry, Hannah swam across five or six times. The mission was incredibly risky, especially because Hannah knew that her false identity papers might not hold up to scrutiny. And sure enough, they didn't. And before she could save anyone, she was arrested and thrown into Hungarian prison. Her captors tortured her every single day, but she refused to tell them a single thing or to even beg for mercy. So they executed her after five months. Facing a firing squad, she refused to put on a blindfold, and she died exactly as she'd lived, staring defiantly into the eyes of people who hated her, knowing she was on the right side of history. Why'd she do it? Why did she parachute into Nazi-occupied territory with sketchy papers, knowing she might die? Well, as she told her friend shortly before she got caught, even if they catch me, the Jews will know that at least one person tried to reach them. Jews in Europe needed to know that they hadn't been forgotten, and Hannah became a symbol of Jewish solidarity across borders. As you might expect, she's considered a hero in Israel, and not just for her bravery and strength, she was also a talented poet and her poem, Ali Khalik is one of Israel's most famous folk songs. But she's far from the only legendary Israeli woman. Golda Meir. Everyone has heard of Israel's Iron Lady. I do not believe that any country's fate in the world uh, can be decided upon by um, other powers, uh, great or small. She was the Middle East's first, and thus far only, female head of state. She led a country during wartime. She was both grandmotherly and tough as nails. She had to be. Her first memory was of slaughter. Golda was born in what is now Ukraine. She remembers her father boarding up the front door and locking her in a cellar. It wasn't a punishment. It was a way to keep her safe from the pogrom that was coming. Golda never forgot what it was like to hide from her neighbor's rage. She refused to spend her life cowering. Even after her family moved to the US, Golda didn't feel safe. She believed that there was only one place for a Jew, and that was their historic homeland. She moved to Mandate Palestine in 1921. For the next two decades, she watched as the world turned away increasingly desperate Jewish refugees. And she became even more convinced of what she'd always known. The Jewish people didn't need the world's sympathy after the fact. They needed strength. That strength finally came in 1948 when the modern state of Israel was born. Golda was one of only two women to sign the new country's Declaration of Independence. And though she was active in politics, she couldn't have imagined that she would one day lead the Jewish state. But that's exactly what happened. She became prime minister in 1969 during a difficult time for Israel. She'd vowed that the Jewish people would never cower again, and she kept her promise, but it wasn't easy. The 1970s served up an unending stream of terror attacks against Jews and Israelis all over the world massacres, hijackings, the murder of 11 athletes at the Munich Olympics, and worst of all, the Yom Kippur War. The 1973 attack took Israel completely by surprise. Thousands died. And though Israel ultimately won the war, the public was seething. Why hadn't the country been prepared? Where were the defenses? And though an inquiry found that Golda wasn't responsible for the failures that led to the war, she knew she had lost the public's trust. She resigned shortly after the war and died four years later. Golda has a controversial legacy, but she remains an icon all over the world. A complicated, fascinating, very human icon. Bella Abzug. There are plenty of Jewish women who campaign for social justice, but Bella Abzug doesn't get enough credit. Even as a little girl, Bella wasn't into gender norms. She didn't like that her synagogue separated men and women, and she really didn't like that she wasn't allowed to say the mourner's Kaddish for her dad after he died. 
She was only 13, but she defied her rabbi's instructions and said the Kaddish anyway. Why should only boys get to pray for their deceased parents? As she grew up, Bella kept on busting norms. She earned a law degree and made a name for herself as a tenants' rights, labor rights, and civil rights liberties attorney. In 1970, she ran for Congress and won. In 1974, she introduced the first ever federal bill supporting gay rights, known as the Equality Act of 1974. Today, virtually all Democrats support gay rights. But in 1974, this wasn't exactly a popular stance. Bella was particularly interested in defending Jewish rights, including the right to self-determination. When the UN declared Zionism to be racism in 1975, Bella used her platform to argue that Zionism is a liberation movement. The resolution, by the way, was revoked in 1991. Bella fought for social justice causes until her death in 1998 mobilize women all over the world to create the kind of planet where there is peace and justice and where there is health for all people in it. She blazed a trail for social justice activists everywhere, especially women, Jews, and other minorities. So there you have it. Five Jewish women who changed the world in their own ways, proving that Jewish women really can do anything that a Jewish man can do, and in heels. That's what they want to wear.